the tenth day before the calends of January, the consulship of Palio and Aper, 929, ab urbe condita. December 23rd, A.D. 176. Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Augustus, victorious in Armenia, Parthia, and Germania, Pontifex Maximus, Pater Patriae, was cold. He was always cold at night now, no matter how many sheepskins he piled on his couch. His eyelids cracked open. The room was dark, save for a smoldering brazier in one corner. Dawn was hours away, but he knew he would sleep no longer, despite the opium in last night's wine. He called for light, and a chamberlain rushed through the door, kindling lamps. By the time his feet touched the marble floor, the room was bright as day. As the chamberlain vanished, his morning secretary appeared, a gray man in a gray tunic, hands splotched with ink. Wordlessly, the secretary seated himself on one side of a table. Marcus sat opposite. The ivory surface between them was a wash in scrolls, each bearing a petition, more or less urgent, for help that only the Emperor of Rome could give. Marcus picked up the nearest scroll. It had been sent months earlier, just before storms closed the sea, by the citizens of a village in Egypt. They claimed to be unable to pay their taxes, since a gang of bandits, known as the Cowboys, had stolen their livestock. To make matters worse, the plague had returned, killing many families. The plague again. He remembered its arrival in Rome, a decade past, when the reek of mass cremations filled the air, and priests walked the streets with censers of purifying incense. Just last year, it had resurfaced in a neighborhood not far from the palace, killed hundreds, and vanished. He dictated a reply to the villagers. Their taxes would be remitted for three years, and sealed it with the ring of Augustus. Then, as the secretary removed a fresh sheet of papyrus from his carrying case, he turned to the next petition. Once, reading had been his greatest pleasure. In the summers, when his mother retired to her companion villa, he would bring armloads of books from the palace library and study them beside a fountain, the musty aroma of old papyrus suffusing every breath. As emperor, he seemed to read nothing but petitions. It was his duty to read them, just as it was his subject's duty to send them, but there were times when duty palled. Deliberately, painstakingly, he worked through a few dozen scrolls, granting aid, clarifying laws, playing emperor. When his voice began to fail, he called for breakfast. It arrived promptly, a small loaf of warm bread, a dish of olive oil, and a cup of wine. He dipped a bit of bread in the olive oil, then sipped the wine. It was very good, Valerian, he thought, laid up by Verus before he died. A slave spirited away the remains of his meal. Outside, beyond the cypresses and winter bare oaks, the sky was going gray. Most days, he would soon have made his way to the reception hall, with its gilded ceiling and dripping water clocks, to hear cases, but not now. Today, he would triumph. It had been a decade since the last time, when he and Varus had ridden together, two of his sons in the golden chariot between them, all Rome applauding the defeat of the Parthians. Today's triumph had been harder to win. Eight years of raids and counter-raids, sucking bogs and windswept hills, barbarians who melted into mists and emerged howling from the trees. Preparations for the triumph had begun months ago. Armor had been polished, horses groomed, garlands hung. Even now, thousands of soldiers were filing toward their places. Soon, a slave would wind a gold-embroidered toga around his shoulders and paint his face red. Then he would mount the triumphal chariot, and the procession would begin. Before we continue, a brief word about this video's sponsor. Around the Palatine were the bustling, cosmopolitan neighborhoods where most Romans lived. On these dangerous streets, magic and the myths seemed very real and the gods were not always benevolent. This is the world of Romanus Magicae, a comic book written by Matthew Blair. 
The comic follows an ex-legionary named Marcus, who stumbles upon a plot to destroy the Empire from within. Marcus must work with a motley collection of former priests, petty criminals, and freed slaves to save Rome from annihilation. The Romanus Magicae team is currently seeking funding on Kickstarter. Click the link in the description to donate. Back to our topic, and to Marcus Aurelius. Evening had fallen by the time the triumph reached the Forum. The procession had begun, as usual, in the Campus Martius, and made its stately way through the city's heart. In the Circus Maximus, where multitudes had gathered to watch, the whole length of the parade had been visible. The gleaming spoils, the sacrificial animals, the prisoners of war, and, just in front of the senators, the dioramas. These paintings showed scenes from the wars. A legion, trapped for days on a waterless plateau, cutting through the enemy ranks, under the sheltering arms of a storm god. A Roman cavalry officer dealing a fatal blow to a German king. A line of Sarmatians, horses and men alike sheathed in silvery scale armor galloping over the frozen Danube. Marcus's golden chariot, drawn by a quartet of white horses, followed the senators. Behind marched the soldiers, singing about the pleasures of beer and barbarian women. It had been a bright day, with a breeze that made the banners flutter, but the wind had fallen with the sun, and a settling chill promised frost. Drawing his cloak closer, Marcus glanced toward Commodus, the prince stood beside him in the chariot, waving to the crowd. He was fifteen now, and newly appointed consul, but he was still irresponsible. Just yesterday, he had been found shooting his bow at a target held up by a slave in the palace gardens. Remember, Caesar, you are mortal. The slave who spoke the traditional warning stood at his left shoulder. Marcus needed no reminders of his mortality. His aching body already proclaimed it. So did the row of fresh bronze statues in Trajan's Forum, each commemorating a general killed in the wars. They were following the Via Sacra, the narrow street that plunged through the marble mountains and colonnaded forests of the Forum. On one side was the Temple of Venus in Rome, built by his grandfather Hadrian. On the other, farther down, was the temple of his father Antoninus, who had taught him so much. He had been fortunate not in wealth or glory, which were nothing, not in being emperor, which was fate. No, he had been fortunate in his teachers and his family. From them he had learned to live in accordance with nature. Through them he had come to understand the freedom that philosophy taught, the wisdom past sorrow, the joy beyond pain. Remember, Caesar, you are mortal. A few months before, on the way back to Rome, he and Commodus had gone to Eleusis. Within the marble walls of the sanctuary, they had stood with the other pilgrims, shoulder to shoulder, Roman, Greek, and barbarian, and watched the rite of rebirth. There, just for a moment, he had glimpsed the brotherhood of mankind, the philosopher's universal city. On the Capitoline, the light of the setting sun rippled along the gilded roof of Jupiter's temple. Torches blazed in the shadows between, marking the processional way, but his gaze drifted upward, beyond the temple and the wheeling birds, into the depths of a darkening sky, where the first stars beaconed the quiet benevolence of the gods. My new book, Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines, is now available as a paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can buy your copy through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore. For more Told & Stone content, check out my channels, Told & Stone Footnotes, and Scenic Roots to the Past, which are linked in the description. Please consider joining other viewers in supporting Told & Stone on Patreon. Thanks for watching.